So thank you everyone for the interesting conversation along the day. And now we are going to move to the last presentation. So it's Terry's paper on payment versus funding, the law of reflux for today. It's a conversation of his take on endogenous money and Toby's and Tobin's and Ray's view. So please, Perry, go ahead. <laughs> um, okay. Um, thank you very much. The um, uh, I'll just dive right right in. So this paper exists and it is on the INET website. I have uh, revised it somewhat. Um, it is act was originally prepared for a festra for Sheila Dow. Um, and that's why I hang it a little bit on her paper, um, which deals with this question of liquidity preference versus endogenous money. Um, but it's a question that I've been um, thinking about for a long time. So it, it wasn't particularly provoked by her, her article. Um, and uh, and it's I took it as an opportunity, the invitation to to write for these festrifts, which which comes when you become sort of superannuated in this profession. Um, it seemed to me an opportunity to re revisit the question of the relation between the money view and post Keynesianism. There are multiple variants of post Keynesianism, of course, and I've never really identified with any of them. Um, though I did write this article, I was asked to write this article about Minsky and so forth. Um, and a review of, of Ray and other things. So I guess I've been somewhat of a fellow traveler, but my fate has been to be seen as, a hetero as heterodox by the self-identified orthodoxy um, and orthodox by the self-identified heterodoxy. So I'm, I'm uh, of course, the money view, the point that I would emphasize though, is that the money view emerges from banking practice both commercial and central banking practice. Um, and so I'm not at all out of line in that world, okay? Um, but that, that line has always been a minority view in academia. And it's interesting to ask why, and perhaps this paper will, will throw some light on that. A central issue in, in all of these matters, I've come to think, is flux and reflux, or as I say in the paper, elasticity of payment and the discipline of funding. The MOOC, if you were really carefully looking at it, you will notice that I talk about this issue in two places, in lecture five, which is the one on Fed funds, um, on funding and mortgage, and then again in lecture 17 on intermediation. Um, but in neither spot do I really um, push adequately into the subtleties. Um, I was really just flagging this issue for later attention. Um, and here I am 10 years later, actually, he, actually dealing with it, I think. Um, there's a lot of that kind of thing in the MOOC, by the way. Okay, so you will, you, just to, you, to be aware that it is, it is really an agenda for a research program more than it is a finished research program. So let me, let me I think that I have five main points. The, from a sort of history of thought point of view, the classic framing of this issue is flux and reflux. So it, go, it, goes, it goes back to the 19th century. Uh, but that's probably unfamiliar to many of the people on this on this on this call. If you aren't a historian of of, of monetary thought, um, the one big bank image I think makes it pretty clear. Okay, that you can imagine credit expansion on the balance sheet of of the one big bank um, just by the bank granting uh, a you know expanding its balance sheet on both sides with a mortgage on the on the asset side and uh, and deposits on the on the liability side, and then buying the house by transferring the mortgage to someone else. The, that's the flux part, okay? The, the reflux part is the question of what happens to the mortgage after that. You know, is, is, is that gonna be willingly held by anybody? Um, and how does that all happen? Um, you can see this, or maybe, maybe the deposit is transferred to somebody who uses it to pay off a loan, in which case the balance sheet of the bank shrinks back down again. That's reflux too. So um, all of that's pretty clear, I think, if you're thinking about the, about the world as one big bank. Decentralization make, uh, of the banking system raises additional problems, and in particular, the problem of liquidity and the money rate of interest, okay, as the price of delaying settlement, um, and as the price that coordinates the traverse of the system toward a new portfolio equilibrium. So in the decentralized world, flux means sort of endogenous money creation. You said, Natalie, about, about endogenous money. Yes, flux is about endogenous money creation by expansion of bank balance sheets on both sides. Um, 
uh, that money is an inside asset, not a not an outside asset. And the money view emphasizes that that what we call money is just the highest form of credit. It's the means of payment to settle other forms of credit lower lower down. Um, this is true, I would insist, of bank money, but also of central bank money. Both the central bank in the money view is a bank, okay, an actual an actual bank. So. Uh, and we use the same concepts for the central bank that we do for banks farther down. Um, and uh, so that's the flux. Reflux is just the opposite. It's endogenous money destruction, okay, uh, by contraction of the balance sheet on both sides. The paper has three cases that it discusses. And the, um, uh, it is, uh, the, uh, uh, which I call um, uh, loan repayment, um, uh, capital market funding and money market funding. Um, I won't go through those cases with the balance sheets. You can you can you can see that. I th I think it's it's not so hard really. That's not the main contribution of the paper to to, to delineate these three possible cases. They're the limiting cases. The point is that in all three of these cases, excess money, the expansion of the balance sheet in the first place, the whole point of this reflux is that excess money is destroyed in some way or another. And the revolving fund of liquid finance, that's Keynes's term in 1937, okay, is restored so that you can then do it again. So that you're, you're able to do flux again and then reflux again. And so there's this sort of disequilibrium movement of the expansion of the balance sheet that makes certain things possible. And then there's, allocation and moving around to, to achieve portfolio equilibrium and get you back to where you can do this again, this, this alchemy of banking expansion of the balance sheet on both sides. And it is the money rate of interest that coordinates the traverse from one portfolio equilibrium to another. So that's the first kind of point. Now that's a history of thought kind of world. And if you read Fullerton or Took, you know, which I've done all of that, and that's where I learned a lot of that. And, and it's so alien from modern thinking that really going back to the original text was the only way that I could really figure it out. In the modern world, and this is the second point, this same, uh, you know, issue arises in the war between the old view and the new view of banking is so-called. Um, the old view being uh, a notion of that emphasizes bank agency, the ability of, of banks to kind of be important in the world because they are using this alchemy of banking. They're using this, this expansion of their balance sheet to give uh, purchasing power to one group instead of another group. Okay, and so that's kind of uh, important. Um, and that's a, that's a source of elasticity. That's the source of flux, okay, in, in, in the world. Um, an important, uh, I'll, I'll mention that this view of the world, you can sort of see in Keynes in the treatise. The treatise on money um, is an old view of money in this, in, in this regard. Contrast that with the new view, okay, which is, which is not an ex-ante point of view, um, but of sort of bank agency, the ability to, to, to break an equilibrium, okay, but, but an ex-post portfolio equilibrium point of view. This is Tobin, this is the monetary Valrasians, and this is Keynes of the general theory, actually, okay, um, so uh, where you're emphasizing discipline and, 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 and reflux. Now, this sort of when I say old view and new view, this, this is because the old view was killed by the new view, okay? Um, and it, was, it was explicitly replaced and it was Tobin who did it, okay? Um, Post-Keynesians were frustrated at the time by the replacement of the old view. Um, and in particular, um, uh, uh, Hicks um, his, in his market view of money, and that there are others who say, you know, look, there were important stuff in the treatise and that got, got kind of lost. And uh, maybe Keynes himself knew about this, but certainly Keynesians, um, particularly the American Keynesians seem to have forgotten about this. So um, I've written a paper about, about, about the evolution of Hicks uh, view, which I, which, I, which I really like actually. Um, and uh, how he came, to, and particularly since he was involved in creating the ISLM sort of model in which he then kind of repudiated, um, I also just recently wrote a book review of this um, of this uh, book by Ingrao and Sardoni about the old view versus the, the, the new view. So um, the point that I would emphasize from the money view is that neither the old view nor the new view is really adequate on its own. OK, we need both. OK, we need flux and reflux. OK, perhaps the old view 
overemphasized flux. And some, some people today overemphasize flux and they don't appreciate the, 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 the channels of reflux, but certainly the equilibrium view um, it leaves no room for bank agency um, and, and has, just, has just eliminated it. And that's a problem. Um, it's part of the equilibrium methodology that, that was adopted in, in, in World War, uh, after World War II, where we're just looking at equilibrium situations and comparing equilibrium situations and not asking how we got from one, what, what broke that. So that's the second sort of framing. So the, the paper proceeds by focusing on three key texts, okay? These are texts for those of you who, who are maybe interested in history of thought again, or, or in one of these groups. These are texts that are very, very well known, and there's been arguments about them for a, ever since they were written. Um, there's huge secondary literature on these things, which I ignore, okay? I don't treat the communities and the, and the back and forth um, on this. I really just am treating each of these texts as a snapshot in time where we see the, people struggling with this flux reflux problem, okay? So the three texts are Keynes, 1937, the ex-ante rate of interest. So this is his response to some of the readers of the general theory who were unhappy that he seemed to have abandoned some of the things he had said in the treatise. And he's saying, no, I haven't, you know, that's all still, that's all still there behind the scenes. Um, and uh, post-Keynesians in particular have grabbed on to this particular text, 1937, and they said, see, that's the real Keynes, you know, and, and so that there, that's a text to conjure with. Um, then fast forward, um, there's Tobin, 1963, Banks as Creators of Credit, um, which is, I, I take to be the origin of, of modern orthodoxy, okay, where he is um, using the, he, he clearly knows something about flux and reflux, probably from his teacher Schumpeter, um, I would say, um, but he's not using that language, but he's using the arguments, okay, so that if you have this in your mind and you're reading, banks as creators of credit, you will understand what that article is about. I, I remember hearing once um, Robert Schiller trying to talk about that. He had no idea what that article was about. And he said so, you know, that this was always puzzling to him, okay? And I think that's because, you know, by the next generation, nobody knows how to even think about, not about flux and reflux. They just know about equilibrium positions. Um, and it was Tobin who had something to do with that. The third text is, is, is uh, Randy Ray's book, which is sort of the, the key text in creation of, of one particular uh, kind of post-Keynesianism, post the modern money theory. Um, so I'm revisiting that 20 years after I wrote a review on it. Um, and I, I, it's pretty clear I, from the, that I am quite influenced by the circuitists, as is Sheila Dow. And I, I find that version of post-Keynesianism much more congenial, um, but I, I never had a very clear answer why. Okay, so this is what I'm doing here. Um, the, and it, in each case, I go through, in each of these three texts, I go through these three channels of reflux and use them to interpret these texts and to make sense of them and to, in the very same framework so that you can see Keynes, Tobin, Ray, same framework, okay, balance sheet framework. So fourth, so all of this now, now this is maybe not so much in the paper. These are reflections on the paper. Some of it's in the paper. Um, why is there such confusion about this flux reflux idea? I mean, some of it's because of equilibrium. I'll come back to that. But I think it's certainly the case that uh, one, real, one important source of, of confusion is Keynes general theory because when you create new purchasing power and it's spent, okay, new spending creates new income. And so the traverse to a new, is not just to a new portfolio, equal, equal, new portfolio equilibrium, but also income is changing, employment is changing. And most people who've been trying to understand Keynes 1937 have gotten all caught up in that, okay? And so I avoid all of that complication by treating only the case where the new purchasing power is to purchase an existing good. So it doesn't create any income, it doesn't create any em employment. And you can see the flux and reflux stripped away from the, from the effective demand uh, point of view. And I argue, uh, or maybe assert, um, that 
uh, that it's independent of it. You know, that you don't need that, that, that this point about flux and reflux has nothing particular to do with effective demand. And so uh, you, can, you can separate these two ideas and, and treat them separately. Um, and that has caused a lot of confusion in the secondary literature is not separating that. A second separate, a second thing, um, big confusion is about the argument about, you know, state agency versus private agency, bank agency. Um, some, and here where politics kind of comes into it, you know, some people want to feel like, um, you know, the government really is very powerful to do good things. War finance is our model of the power of government. And war finance is a treasury issue, not a banking issue. Whereas bank finance is peace finance. And uh, so we don't really need to, to bring banking into the situation. This also, I blame a little bit on Keynes, 1940, How to Pay for the War, where he is emphasizing that it's a real resource problem, okay, and which is correct. But what he doesn't say, which is also correct, is that war finance also typically requires banking. Typically in war, you're having using bank finance in the first instance, and then you're refunding that with bond issues or something like that. Um, so there's flux and periodic reflux through bond funding in war finance. And so I insist on using, on, on, on saying, no, the central bank is where we're gonna focus, even when we're talking about war finance, You know that it's not just an agent of the treasury doing whatever it needs to do. The flux reflux issue is there in war finance as well. Um, and, uh, and so that's how I, I deal with that second uh, sort of confusion. A third confusion, I think, is, is about interest rate for formation. You hear everything, that the interest rate is fundamentally a real thing from utility functions or, or production functions. It's a fundamentally monetary thing, but maybe it's just an exogenous policy parameter. That's, that's Randy Ray's sort of position. Um, and uh, to, and um, Sheila Dow says uh, that's some of the argument about endogenous money versus liquidity preference. What a sort of a thing is this interest rate? Well, the money view says that the rate of interest is the wholesale price of money. It's the shadow price of settlement. It's a market price in, in the first instance. Uh, the central bank can push it around, but it can only push it around by absorbing excess supplier demand at, at, a, at a disequilibrium price. Um, and that's how it, that's how it does it. Um, and in doing so, it also is by affecting the price of liquidity, it's affecting all other asset prices too. And if you've done the MOOC, you know that I have a story about the failure of the expectations hypothesis of the term structure, the failure of, of the uh, uh, uncovered interest parity, and actually most recently, the failure of covered interest parity as well, okay? Which in the MOOC, I treat as a fact that CIP is, is, a, is a fact, but it's not a fact. Um, and uh, as, as we see in global conditions now, um, but that's about the dealer function and a topic for another day. I, I think behind all of these is the, is the uh, enormous attraction of sort of equilibrium thinking and especially intertemporal equilibrium thinking um, to economists um, of the right and the left. This is true of the Serafians as well as the marginalists. You know, it's, um, and the flux reflux frame is about using the elasticity of banking to explore one particular path forward for the economy rather than another one. You know, it's who is getting access to this newly minted purchasing power and therefore they get a chance to make their dreams come true or at least a chance, the dreams of the future to, to explore that path. Other people don't get a chance. And so, but that's an image of, of economic evolution as sort of probing in the dark, building a bridge towards shores unknown. I've used images like that be, before. And, and it is in fact, the flux that allows you to do that. But then there's a check on the flux, okay, which is reflux. You can't do just anything you want, you know. And so there, and these are natural channels of, of, re, of reflux, which if you block them can cause some, cause some problems. So now I'll just say three things and then stop. In, in the paper, it, 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 it is about these three texts. It's sort of a history of thought thing. But I do think that it addresses a very um, fundamental issue um, and one that has very, very widespread ramifications um, in, in all monetary and financial areas. Um, the uh, present day 
well, I mentioned war finance and the transition to peace finance. Um, the present day transition that we're going to be going through from COVID finance to post COVID finance, you know, is, is going to be about, we've had huge flux. We've had huge flux. The question is, what, where, what are we going to do with this enormous expansion of particularly central bank balance sheets? Some people think we need austerity. Maybe we just need reflux. Okay. And how would we manage that? Okay. So that's one issue. The same issue arises because war finance and development finance are very similar um, in development finance, where if you're using, your, using the elasticity of bank credit, um, and, and including climate finance too, um, and flux is a, flux fine, but then reflux payment and then funding. And, uh, and it arises, of course, in, in international money debate about, uh, about SDRs and the swap lines and so forth. I think that, that, that getting clear in, in our minds about flux and reflux, about what are short-term liquidity issues and what are long-term capital finance issues, okay, is the beginning of clear thinking on all these matters. Um, and uh, the notion that sort of there's some money magic, you know, is there is money magic. The alchemy of banking, the ability of, the, of banks to expand their balance sheet on both sides is, an, is a very useful and interesting property, okay? But that's flux, okay? We need, we need also to, to remember about reflux, okay? And so that's what this paper is trying to put them both on the same, on the, in the same analytical framework um, in, in much the way that Fullerton did in, in, in you know, 1850 for a much simpler world, okay? And now we have a world uh, that is internet, you know, it's much more complicated world, but I think the analytical distinction is still there. And let me just stop there with that provo provocation. So this thing will be published in the, there's gonna be two volumes of Sheila Dow's uh, Festschrift. Um, and uh, I've made some revisions to it, um, but they're, they're not substantive. They're just to make it things that people tripped over. They weren't clear. The typical things people trip over is that I skip steps in the balance sheets. And so they, which, which is a problem I've always had. So I need to go more, care, more slowly and more carefully so that people can follow the logic of it. Um, so let me stop there, Natalie. Thank you, Perry. So we can open for the Q&A session and maybe I just open the floor with one question I have. I don't know if I'm going to be very clear, but I mean, from a post-Canadian perspective of this endogenous money view, not only from Ray, but also more recent authors such as Mark Lavoie or even for Wheeler, um, the argument is that the interest rate is, as you said, a policy parameter. So it is exogenous and that means that central bank can set and sustain that level without uh, market forces con constraints. And, uh, and for me, it's not very clear which constraints do you see for that? I mean, what your position is about it as a market price and a policy price. So maybe if you can talk a little bit more about it. Yes, so, you know, in, in the MOOC, um, because we're, we're looking at money markets, um, we're in general thinking of this interest rate as arising for, as a symptom of the match or mismatch between cash flows and cash commitments, that people who have made promises to pay that they're unable to meet at the moment have to push it off into the future. They, they, they have to be, they're deficit agents at the clearing and they need to borrow and they need to convince the surplus agents to lend to them. Okay, and one of the ways they convince them is by paying them a rate of interest. Okay, so we could imagine that thing working without any central bank um, or, or rather just with a hierarchy of, of, of private profit maximizing banks. Okay, and, that, and there are times in history when that is sort of right. So there, there is, there, that is a market, that is a theory of the short-term rate of interest that is, that is a money rate of interest, importantly. Okay, this has nothing to do with utility functions or production functions. So it is not, it is not the standard um, rate of interest. It's a monetary theory of the rate of interest. Okay. Now, superimpose on that the notion that there's a central bank. 
which is able to push that price around a little bit. And why? Because the central bank's liabilities are the ultimate means of payment in a particular area. Um, and so that if there is, if there is a mismatch between cash flows and cash commitments, the central bank can, can uh, uh, step in and take, take whatever excess there is on its own balance sheet. That's what allows the central bank to push the overnight interest rate around. Okay. Um, and so it's not wrong to say that it can be a policy parameter, but I think the notion that it's a free variable, okay, is where I would, where I would push back and say, you, you know, really, are you serious? You think you can put it anywhere you want? You know, R remember where, remember what it's doing also, you know, from this point of view, that it's, that it's giving a signal to people to, to the economy as a whole. It's sort of a, a sufficient statistic saying how well are cash commitments and cash and cash flows lining up with each other, okay? And if you give people a false signal about that, then the coordination of the market economy may start to run into trouble. The whole, the whole money view way of thinking about the world is, is that these, these prices are key for coordination of the macroeconomy. It's not a monetary, vol monetary valuation equilibrium where there's, a, there's a, you know, a, a vector of prices for all the commodities that, is, that are clearing them all out into the future intertemporally. No, there's, there's this little thing where people are reaching out, you know, this bridge across the chasm, and this little rate of interest is doing a lot of work for you, okay? So you're, you're, you mess with it at your peril. It doesn't mean to say that it's always sent giving the right message, okay? Um, and that you, you, and stabilization by the central bank, you know, seems there are good reasons to want to do that. Um, but I think viewing it as a free variable that you can set anywhere you want, okay? Is is a is a is is not understanding what it is actually doing, what it what what that price is doing in the in the in the modern economy, um, and uh, and 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 could and could be and could be a problem, could be a problem. So it's not. I don't know. Does that answer your question, Natalie? Yes, it does. I mean, okay. I think it's the difference about it's the consequence and how the price is set. The consequence of the level of the rate and the, how the prices uh -huh. is, is determined. I mean, I think it are two different things. I don't know. See, but I, I, I understand. Maybe I'll say one more one more thing. The, in in orthodoxy, because you're abstracting from the payment system and you're abstracting from the dealer system, also you're basically it's the abstraction that most economists are trained is a world in which liquidity is a free good. Okay, and so there's nothing for the interest rate to do. <laughs> Right, but it once you bring those in, I mean, except just intertemporal consumption or whatever, you know. But but it once you bring those things in, it's doing something, okay. And so you want to be you by all means mess with that, you know, use it as a. But 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 be careful. It's not doing what you think it's doing. It's not intertemporal consumption. Definitely not. It's it is a monetary variable. Yeah, thank you, Perry. I, we have a follow-up question here from Wynne Monroe, if you want to ask. And then I just saw a lot of raising hands to keep up the discussion. So Thanks. Please, yeah, yeah, so I, I just had a question that's kind of related to this and, and what you were talking about earlier about, um, you know, on the one hand, it, you know, are we talking about interest rates? Is this kind of free variable? And, you know, uh, before about um, the kind of alchemy of, of banking in a way. And I guess I was wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit to the, um, the relationship between this kind of uh, this view of money and the kind of real economic constraints, whether at the kind of micro level of the bank or at the macro level. So, you know, what, what you know, when, in the back of my mind, I have some image of, you know, things go bad in the economy and now, you know, there's a sense that we need more discipline um you know that there are limits either at the state or the bank level for kind of um expanding these uh or contracting these balance sheets kind of depending on how they interact with the real economy and so i was wondering if you had um if you could maybe elaborate a little bit you know either at the kind of micro banking level or the more macro um level about yeah this kind of uh the kind of relationship to the real economy Yes, the real economy. <laughs> um, 
I always say the there's there's nothing more real than money. I mean, that is the money view thing, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, there is there's people producing things and consuming things out there. And what you're concerned about is coordinating that activity. Um, all of those activities are cash inflow, cash outflow activities, right? And so they are generating pressure on the short-term rate of interest, just just like people who are just doing financial stuff, or, you know, I always think in terms of, of, of Copeland's money flows, you know, that the below the line stuff, you know, is, is most of it, actually. And so that's why in the MOOC, we mostly deal with that, you know, that, that, that if, a, if, if you were, if somebody from Mars came down, they would say, oh, I see money is what you use to clear the stock market transactions. Like, uh, well, there, there, some of it we use, you know, for the local store and, and for, and for wages too. Um, and that also is going to impact. And what I, my concern, and I'll come back to the, go back to, you know, reference the previous question, is that when you get the price of money wrong as a policy variable, okay, uh, deliberately, okay, you are, you are encouraging people to behave in ways that may not be sustainable. Okay, um, and you can, you could, uh, they, Minsky was very worried about this, you know, that we were, we were, you know, bailing things out without wiping out the bad debt, and so can, that would just keep make keep make it more and more and more fragile, um, because we aren't appreciating what these financial crises are doing. You know, they are they are moving us from a fragile uh, situation to a robust situation, in which case we can then start over again. So if you if you halt that process, you need to have some substitute for it, you know, or or you you, you, you I can understand that you want to halt that lender of last resort, fine, but the but but you do need to uh, wipe out the the you, you don't want to be running your economy with zombie companies, you know that's that's that is a recipe for for disaster really slow motion disaster, decadal long. You know, and so that's 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 the concern. Does that that gets to your? That's what you're getting at, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, Asgar has a raising hand, so want want to ask? Yeah. So just a, a quick follow up on the last point. You you said the that we needed the reflux after all the balance sheet increase of the central banks. And this is something that quite many people have been waiting for since the financial crisis 2008. And we have seen it even increasing even more. I referred to the latest speech by Andy Haldane, inflation tiger by the tail a couple of weeks ago, a wonderful thing that shows the balance sheet expansion even you know, increasing last year more than, than after last crisis and the substantial growth since then. So I'm a bit puzzled about how to visualize the reflux of this, because on top of all this, we see the increased interaction between central banking and treasuries, you know, adding to this, you know, not only central bank saving the financial system like 2008, but in addition, you know, yeah, I think you had 1.9 trillion now in the, in the, going from the, um, Congress to the Senate. So, so reflux is puzzling for me on this aspect, uh, uh, even though I know it has to happen. So, yeah. I mean, so I mean, one of the one of the things that we're going to see um, is that the government is expanding its its balance sheet. You know, writing checks to people, and they're just using these checks to pay back back rent and back mortgages, and so it it disappears from the economy. That's that's reflux right there. Okay, you're th that you're you're that, and so um, another thing you can do is is you know try to fund this more long term. Um, I think it would be great if the government went into the annuity business. You know, personally, I would be quite willing to transfer my cash balance into a real annuity. And the only one who can give me a real annuity is, is the government. That's what Social Security is. You know, I think there is a large unmet demand for that. that. I mean, this is the sort of thing you see after wars, right? When you, when you, when you, need, you need to kind of, you know, get 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 your balance sheet under control again, um, and we should look at what happens after wars as as an example 
to the, of the range of possible things that are available to us. Okay, and it's not just about austerity, really. I mean, it's too much debt. You're not going to get rid of that with austerity. You 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 need you need uh, you need you know debt debt restructuring basically, and uh, the uh, does that. Anyway, maybe we should take a couple because I do have a hard stop at two. So I want to make sure to hear. Okay, then then go ahead and after that, then we'll just go ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Perry, uh, for this. Um, I, I try and be uh, quick. I, ha I haven't, uh, we haven't talked much about flux and reflux, you and I. So I was interested to hear some familiar ideas expressed uh, in terms of this particular debate. The thing I was uh, that came to mind was um, this distinction between short-term liquidity needs and long-term finance, and I could understand the moment of crisis. Uh, and I, and you you kind of said this a moment ago. The moment of crisis is uh, a point at which a resolution between those two needs is sort of sought out by by whatever means are available. And and during a crisis, as we know, it's it's not it is quick, but it's not pretty. Um, I was thinking about a debate, which I know at least from, you know, Badgett um, and, and surely comes up in many places where there's a question of what securities to discount during a crisis, right? And so in a liquidity where, where there's no liquidity, it's hard to assign reasonable prices to things or to distinguish good assets from bad assets because no one wants to buy anything. So there's a question of, of identifying assets that it's a pretty subjective judgment, right? But assets that that would be good during normal times, whatever that means. So fast forward to now, you know, right before COVID, the the Fed at least was having uh, conversations about quote unquote normalization. You know, the the balance sheet had expanded from just under a trillion to over four trillion around the crisis. And so, what was normal going to mean? And now we start talking about normal, and we we had we dealt with the pandemic, and and that will be done at some point. Um, so now we're kind of living through a moment where short-term liquidity needs have twice in the last decade and a half, um, been dramatic. And we are now are at the point where the hangover from that is on the, is on the balance sheet, um, and some way forward has to be found. So I guess I, I wonder, uh, I wonder if you could point us in a direction about how to think about that debate in terms of, of flux and reflux, um, or you can take it in, in another direction uh, if you prefer. Thanks, Perry. Did you want to let Anush? Yeah, Anush, if you want to make the last question. Okay, thanks, Perry. Lovely to see you as usual. Um, I just, it strikes me so much how your, I mean, you mentioned Fullerton, the the world of commercial banking and the banking school is so uh, present in your thinking and i one of the things that minsky it strikes me that minsky is doing is trying to update the banking school for a world of business not a world of commerce right for for schumpeter's world for gershenkron's world not for for badgett's world so when we're looking into the future that bridge is we're trying to build these long -term capital and you, you can move on from business finance and just talk about household finance or personal finance. You know, human beings are long-term capital assets. So, you know, it's like they have to be funded and taken care of for a long time. And that means that, you know, time, dark forces of time and uncertainty and all of that. So it's the, the, the what is the signal that the market, the, that the interest rate, the market price of interest is sending? It's actually a lot of noise in that signal precisely because the time scales are so elongated. And therefore the operation of flux and reflux that was native to the world of commerce, um, kind of, and this is of course Minsky's point, it's kind of all wonky in, in a world of long-lived capital assets and those time scales are longer. So the dark forces are that much more operative. And therefore it's not merely a question of your absolute dread forces, the central bank can't set the interest rate like three variables. But on the other hand, uh, the banks themselves and the system itself is is kind of doesn't go where to set it either, because they're kind of, you know, uh, more exposed in this world to these dark forces, and so the work of 
the work of hierarchy in setting the bounds of the possible, it seems like it's that much more important in, in Schumpeter's world than it was in Fullerton's world. And so it's a slightly different relationship between you know, market and nudging it around uh, because the a priori uh, assumption is that in fact markets are doing it quite poorly. And the, the, the hybridity is therefore that much more intimate than it was in, in the old world. So I suppose that the, 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 the question is, is, is about the, the framework of thinking about a pure money rate of interest and the central bank imposing itself sounds like a 19th century view of things, not a, not a, uh, um, uh, the post Minsky world uh, view of things. But I, I know this is a big question we're almost out of time, but. Um, well, that's, um, you know, that's related to Dan's question, you know, what securities to discount in a crisis, um, where the, you know, the 19th century conception of liquidity is, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, commercial commercial paper, you know, uh, real bills, things, these are goods on their way till to sale. And so they're supposed to be sort of self liquidating, but but occasionally that messes up. And so that's why you you need you need this facility. Whereas now we're financing long lived capital goods. And so we have bonds and so forth. And, 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 and now we ha are using the very same process, you know, through securitized student loans or securitized home mortgages, which is, you know, what is a, what is a securitized home mortgage? It's, it's, it's basically going to be paid back with wage income. So it's not actually the, you know, the, this goes back to that income versus cash flow. Owner occupied housing gives you no cash flow. You know, the cash flow that's going to pay the mortgage, okay, is is you going out and selling your labor, okay? That's 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 actually what's getting capitalized in 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 the mortgage, and then these things are packaged together into bonds and they're traded in global markets. So, it's true that modern you know modern uh, finance, I mean, it's not just banking finance; it's it's market based, it's money market funding of capital market lending, but it's global too, and this is this this is where budget was ahead of Minsky, right? That that the world the world that Fullerton and Took are talking about is a world of global fin global finance um, with its lo with its central location in London. Okay, and they are aware of that, um, and they're aware that the Bank of England is is facing shocks that come from the global world um, as well as as well as the logic. So. The, I guess maybe the point is that it's that this system isn't standing still. You know, it's evolving, and so we need to make up new rules for each stage of it. So, what are the rules that are emerging in practice today? Okay, it seems that what we're doing is well, you 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 want to be which which assets are you going to use? You know, that you're going to be um, uh, stabilizing the market for core assets, not periphery assets. And I mean that in both the international sense and, and, in, and in the domestic sense, so that you're, you're viewing the uh, uh, government, you know, government securities as, okay, you know, the Fed is the government bank anyway, okay? So um, it, th that's a natural instrument for it to intervene in. What it does in a crisis is it moves up the term structure, you know, that instead of, instead of just dealing with the overnight, you know, it will, it will start, to do, start to try to do the three month. And if that's not enough, it'll go to the 10 year, you know? So that creating some term structure of government debt, you know, then the private markets, hopefully will take that there'll be a spread around that you know at all the, at all these points um, and that's sort of that's sort of what they've done what in the most recent you know covid case um, where the fed is actually acting as global global dealer of last resort um, quite quite readily but using basically its own paper you know that if the world the world is holding treasury bills um, or if they're not holding treasury bills, they're holding something that maybe they can swap with somebody else to get a treasury bill so they can go to the repo facility. And so the Fed is, is acting as dealer of last resort. What I would, the, the important thing about the modern thing that's emerging, okay, is we lost sight of, you know, Badgett was more like modern times than anything in the preceding in, in the intervening hundred years where we, we got used to thinking of lender of last resort as somehow protecting banks okay 
And because the banks had some little credit magic or something that they did, and they were vital, you know. And uh, I think that getting to the point where you're really just trying to, you know, ensure continuous operation of markets, um, that's sort of what's happening now. And you don't need to protect individual, you know, so the too big to fail thing can, one way out of that is 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 not by lending to banks, but by but by buying securities, um, and we're not very good at it. You know, we're we're making it up as we as we go along, um, and uh, the role of the government is is as I say much bigger deal than it was in Badgett's day. Um, but this business of you know, there were treasury bills, exchequer bills, and they they played an important role in, in crises, uh, as a matter of fact. But it was short-term paper mostly. Um, and uh, that's not going to do the trick, you know, today. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I, I don't mean, I don't at all want to signal that somehow I have the answers to these things. But I think that this is the right way to be thinking about them. Okay. And to be uh, noticing what the what the what what the central banks are being sort of forced to do, and so it does make me worry about you know loose talk about negative interest rates or something. You know, it's like if you think that the overnight rate of interest is playing an important coordinating role in in making people pay their bills, and then you offer them a negative rate of interest, you have basically eliminated the survival constraint that is keeping the whole system coordinated, okay? I, I, it, it worries me, you know, that because all pe people who do negative interest rate, they're just saying, oh, we just need to stimulate spending somehow. We need to get people to spend. Well, why don't you just spend then? You know, the, the government can spend. It's, there's no problem. You know, this negative interest rate way of doing it is storing up lots of trouble, and and you know it's already Japan, it's already Europe, um, and it's about time for the U.S. I think to say, no, <laughs> no, that's that's not that's not a good plan, that's not a good plan. Um, I, I I was rambling answer, but the I I really did not understand this funding. I, I I'd be interested. Anyone who has a look at look at that paper, I'm interested in having further conversations about it because I do think that this issue of of flux and reflux might be the right frame for thinking about, you know, dealing with this with this um, monetary overhang, okay, that we have right now, okay. And so, just careful. I haven't actually done the work to think through that, but it seems to me that this is at least something that is 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 a different way of thinking about this problem than oh my God, we need to raise taxes or the government cut spending or something. Um, well, maybe not. M maybe not. Maybe not. Um, once you look at it in this frame, that doesn't mean to say that there won't be pain. Um, and uh, there is reflux. Reflux does things. Reflux does things. Um, anyway, I am already over my so-called hard stop, so I'm getting large waves here. Um, so I'm very sorry because that means I'm missing the liquidity happy hour, which is my favorite part of these events. So. Uh, I need to either change my my timing here or or get, get control control my speaking more. But can I can I wave goodbye? And thank Bye. you for, for a, a very stimulating day and uh, and and wish you well and and happy libation. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, thank Barry. you, Barry. See you later. Okay. Bye. Bye.